Um, first off, um, we will have uh, Maria Joao Rodriguez speak. That's the president um, of FEPS. For those of you who don't know FEPS, I guess most do. Uh, the Foundation for European Progressive Studies is the think tank of um, the progressive family here in Brussels level, so linked to but independent of, of the Party of European Socialists and the group of um, socialists and um, social democrats uh, in the parliament. Um, she's also a, a former minister in Portugal. She had um, significant uh, positions in all um, European institutions and is also an academic. So she has thought about democracy and how to address young people, of course, also throughout her careers from many different angles. And she will um, kick us off and welcome everybody uh, officially again as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, it's on. Hello, everybody. Really a pleasure to have such a full um, room. Huh? This is great. And uh, welcome all of you to FAPS, uh, the European Foundation of Progressive Studies. We are very pleased to launch today a new report of our flagship uh, project dealing with young people. We started, some of you will remember, with the Millennials uh, projects, many important reports, very influential reports. And now we have a new series called The Builders of Progress. And uh, this time around with this report, we are focusing on a very important issue for us. This is about young people in disadvantage, and we ask how are they dealing with the democracy? Because we feel there is something wrong happening, something we should be worried about. Uh, we see that uh, sometimes there is frustration, uh, there is abstention in the democratic life. Sometimes it's even worse, there is a kind of anger, and we see uh, some young people joining um, the far right in Europe, really worried. We need to understand what is going on. And that's why we launched this uh, new uh, joint research, uh, this time using focus groups and uh, expert interviews to go into depth to understand what is really the, the, the problem. And uh, well, we have the conclusions, and the conclusions are really extremely rich and important for us. First of all, the positive side. Young people, they do believe in democracy. But on the other hand, they are extremely critical on the way our democracy is working. They want another kind of democracy. This is very clear. And so this report is coming with very precise <coughs> recommendations how to reform our democracy at all levels, the local, the national, but also the European. And this is the right moment to come with these recommendations because we are going to European elections and this is a unique moment for us to make the big shifts we need to make. We know uh, that young people um, are mostly mobilized by very concrete causes. Better jobs, better working conditions, housing, and of course, climate change, to give examples. Uh, but they feel that democracies are not delivering. So I would say, for my, uh, when I read the report, I said, well, here we are again. In the end, what is at stake is very simple. We need to have much higher involvement of young people at all levels to make sure that our democracies deliver real solutions for all these problems. This is as simple as that. And when we see what is happening, we need to recognize that a lot should be changed. So big thanks from our side as FEPS, because we could put together a great partnership uh, with uh, our foundations uh, in different countries. We were covering Ireland, France, Spain, Hungary, and Poland, so a very good sample of what happening in the European Union. And um, it was really great to have such a qualified <coughs> team and all these foundations, member foundations of FAPS, working together. Big thanks also in advance to all of you, because I'm sure that we are going to a very lively, lively debate. And let's uh, go on working together, because this is the moment, as I told you, for us to come with the big ideas, the big ambition, 
and to ask our political family and European institutions really to change democracy, to make it um, really a common house for everyone with young people and young people in disadvantage as the top priority. So this is uh, my big thanks for all of you. And let's, let's start. Matteo. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, the mic I'm taking. I'm taking the mic with me, indeed. Um, right, and then let's get right to it. Um, um, next up will be um, Shana Cohen, who is the main editor of the comparative study, um, which Maria already alluded to. Uh, she's also the director of TASK, which is a progressive think tank based in Ireland and also a member of FEPS. FEPS is a uh, member-based organization. And she's also an academ academic currently teaching and researching also in the UK and in Cambridge. And she's going to provide some of the main findings of the report and some of the um, key recommendations. We'll have ample opportunity to go more in detail later on, but um, she go is going to kick us uh, off with some, some of these main findings. the right and left for the uh, presentation and that's going to come on now that's okay I can also, yeah. Wait, um. Um, hi thank you very much for coming and before I get started um, I just want to thank Matteo because without Matteo this report really would not have happened he put quite a lot of effort into it can everybody hear me Excellent. Okay. So, um, yes, I want to thank Matteo and all of the authors and for FEPS for your support for the project. This is part of a, um, it may seem surprising because Ireland, nobody really thinks about Ireland in terms of the far right, but it's part of a larger program at TASC as well because part of our mission is sustained democracy. We haven't had the same mobilization of the far right, but it's starting to build, um, whether it's from external influence or it's from within Ireland. And so for us, this at task, this is a very timely report because as you'll see in my description of the report, even though Ireland is the wealthiest of the five countries, it has the highest GDP per capita, it's also, I would argue, one of the most alienated in terms of youth views and participation in politics. Okay. okay. <laughs> Uh, uh, wait, wait, there you go, hold on. Is that, uh, yep, I think it was this one. Okay, why, why this report? Um, so I proposed this report to Matteo because if you look at surveys, which I'm sure, judging from the fact you're attending this seminar, you've seen the surveys that regularly say that young people not only um, are disenchanted with democracy, they don't mind an authoritarian government. So um, I wanted to explore this. I proposed to Matteo that we do a qualitative study to really dig in to what that means. And also to go beyond the potential bias of it being these surveys being very middle class. And so we deliberately targeted young people from areas of high deprivation and diverse groups. So for instance, in Ireland, I had a um, one focus group with migrants. Um, and not, not European, African and South American migrants, and then one focus group with travelers, which if, for those of you who are not familiar, they're, it's usually travelers in Roma um, who are the most discriminated against, arguably, group in, uh, in Europe. And what we found was, was a lot more complicated, I think. So the surveys, though, typically show like only, I was quoting the Open Society Barometer, which from last year, which showed that only 57% of 18 to 35 year olds thought democracy was preferable to any other form of government. 42% believe that army rule was a good way to rule the country. And 35% believe a good way to rule the country was having leaders, leaders who don't have to bother with parliaments and elections. So the question is whether or not parliament is, what we found is whether or not parliament is functioning properly. Not that you should just get rid of parliament, but that parliament isn't functioning properly. Uh, no, no, that's okay. Go to two. Um, so that what we found, young people's views toward democracy are complex. You can't just say they don't like democracy. 
um, in fact, many, many of you might fit into that age group, so I should say you don't like democracy, believe in the democratic principle, but its function needs to improve. And this was the most consistent <coughs> finding. It's not working for us. It's not that we don't believe in democracy. It's just not working for us. Trust in government, and this is another nuance that we found. It's actually government in political parties where young people are not, um, don't feel connected. It's not necessarily democracy as a political system. No, no young person that I talked to thought, oh, I'm just going to give up my human rights. Nobody thought that. But they said, why, it's more, why don't local politicians come and talk to us? I, I would like to talk to a politician. Trust in local government is higher, and this was also consistent across the countries, is higher than in national government. So one of the things we did find is, um, that I didn't mention, but that I should emphasize now, is I, I told you that Ireland was uh, the wealthiest country per capita, but what we found, regardless of the political and economic context, Ireland's a small country, has a parli parliament, does not have like, um, the head of state is a president, not a king. Um, the, um, the, but the, pre the, you know, it doesn't have the concentration of power that you would have in the president of France. So it's very different political systems. Ireland has a long history of uh, colonialism and has still a, an uncertain situation in the north, um, which is, uh, as we speak, very uncertain. So, um, sorry, I'm just going to go back to that. Um, but what we found were consistent findings across the locations. So this is just an example from Ireland from the Central Statistics Office that you can see. Can everybody see that? Um, you can see that, I can't see it. Um, the local authority has, uh, in the national government, um, but if you look at the political parties, they are just not doing well. So when we talk about elections in June, it's not that you know they distaste they, they have distaste for a particular political party. They just don't like all political parties. Okay. Um, so the methodology, as I mentioned, we targeted young people from disadvantaged backgrounds, urban and rural. This was a small scale study designed to inform future research and the recommendations. We each did three focus groups and 10 interviews with experts, which could include politicians, academics, and civil society representatives. So I interviewed union representatives because there's declining union membership among young people. And I interviewed um, somebody from Sinn Féin, which is the party in Ireland that would be the most appealing to young people. And he said, we're in despair. We can't get anybody to run. We are really struggling to get people to run for election. And so, um, especially young people, because they don't see, don't see the point. Um, and again, like I said, it's countries with very different histories where we'd find the same, um, the same findings. Okay, so the findings were um, that young people wanted politicians to pay attention to their issues. And these, I'm sure you're quite aware of, but for people who are living in poverty or, or economic insecurity with maybe not the same opportunities that their peers have, they would be, they want politicians to pay attention to unemployment, job insecurity, regional inequalities. If you're living in a rural area with limited investment, you would be upset that the capital receives so much more investment than where you're living. Some young people were carers for their parents. Mental health is a huge issue. There's not enough investment in children and adolescent mental health services. Cost of living crisis for young people in general, in a place like Ireland, there's a cost of living crisis, but we found that in each of the countries. Housing is related to that, and pressures on um, support services. If you look at um, the NEETS, uh, does everybody know that term? Not in employment, education, or training. Um, so Ireland, where I found pervasive alienation among young people, has a very low, um, it's very low, and it's, and is it, uh, it's all the way, it's between Germany and Austria. Um, the other countries, Spain is higher, France is higher, Poland is higher, um, and, and Hungary is higher. So Ireland was way down at the bottom, but I'm, in fact, I was gonna, in terms of methodology, I found it so difficult to do research um, that I had one focus group cancel on me last minute because they're like, we don't understand why you want to talk to us about politics because nobody talks to us about politics, so why should we talk to you about politics? And they have the most of all the countries in the study, the most, according to data, most economic opportunity. So to rebuild trust in politics, they said if you want to do that, we need to be listened to. We need to trust political representatives. We feel disconnected from democratic institutions. 
one of the issues that came up repeatedly is there's, is such a, there's too much focus on voting as the only expression of political engagement, not enough on other ways of getting involved, changing your local area. So it's not just protesting and it's not just voting. There's crowdfunding, there's attending town halls, there's signing a petition. Um, but the most important thing is we'll get to in just a second was seeing tangible impact from engagement. It, sorry, no, let's move the back. Okay, so lack of understanding. This was civic education came out is, is quite important, the lack of it, and more engaged in local politics. Okay. Um, so they, um, a big complaint was, and I think this is across all five countries, politicians don't come to talk to them. They come when they need their vote. That I heard repeatedly. I see a politician when it's election season, he comes not, or she comes knocking at my door. I don't see them between elections. Um, bureaucracy is unresponsive. It's also bureaucracy. It's totally intangible sometimes. And two, uh, the language is inaccessible. The big one, the really big one is the absence of concrete benefits. So there's no process of I input into policy and I see an output. That logic isn't there for young people. It's not because they're spending too much time on social media. It's not because they're playing video games or don't care. It's actually, they are interested, but they just want to see tangible effects in their area. One example I could give you is a young woman I was talking to, and I asked her if she ever voted. She said, no, and my mother never voted. I won't vote, I don't want to vote. And I, um, I said, well, would you be interested in signing a petition? No. Would you be interested in going, like, you know, talking to your politicians? No. Would you be interested in, in a, any kind of effort to build a playground in your local area? Yes, I would do that. That would be good for my younger brother. If I could do that through engaging in politics, then I'm happy to do that. So it was that kind of start from the benefit and then work backwards in which way <coughs> you want to participate. So too few roots. Even, this goes back to civic education, which could be something to think about at an EU level. It's just the roots are unknown. Um, little recognition of their concerns, going back to the first slide. And again, it's the precarity. You don't have time to engage in politics. And there's a stigma of being identified with a political party. Um, this is from Poland. Uh, politicians do not pay attention to the young because they do not constitute a significant voting group. We go and protest and they still do their own thing and push what they like behind our backs. This is before the elections, so that maybe this, this quote would be a bit different. Okay. Um, they want greater, in our study, they want greater investment in spaces and platforms for engagement, whether they're online or in person, but in person is actually really important. Um, recognition of their values versus the values of political parties. More opportunities to contribute to policymaking. So one thing came up with, do you know what participatory budgeting is? So young people's participatory budgeting. So like a you know, local budget would have 2% dedicated to what young people want to happen in the local area. Um, want more dynamic, flexible, and fluid mechanisms of engagement. So it doesn't have to be at a certain time, or it doesn't have to be show up and become a member of a political party and then canvas. Um, Again, seeing positive changes and less polarizing social media. They want face-to-face -face interaction because it's the only remedy to the information they receive online, disinformation. So if you have the politician in front of you, they can tell you face-to-face -face what they think. Um, so quickly, uh, we'll, we can go over these when we're talking later. Mainstream young people across all institutions within the EU uh, strength and cooperation between the EU umbrella organizations, so they're not fragmented. Um, again and again, youth services came up as the only thing young people respected. They wanted, they trusted youth services. So at an EU and a national level, we need to see more investment in youth services and ways in which participation in youth services could lead to um, participation in politics. I'll, I'll finish quickly, but one, one um, focus group I did, they said the only thing we trust is youth services. Youth services gave us the values we have, which are not what politicians have. Politicians have different values because they're seen as middle class, privileged, and elitist. Uh, elitist. You know, they would look down upon them. Um, again, expand participatory mechanisms. So we need better data, um, not just surveys that show how alienated young people are from politics. Um, include promote inclusion and diversity. 
I mean, none of the travelers that I interviewed, that I included in the study will vote. Maybe one or two of them in their lifetimes will vote. And that's, or they'll vote for the party of their parents. There won't be an education process because politicians don't think it's worth it. And we can't really have that logic. Um, so I uh, can share this, and the, these are all in the report. Um, did I do that? Um, <laughs> um, so uh, just use services again and better representation of um, underrepresented groups. So there need to be more forums for participating. One of them is civil society. So it doesn't have to be like European Parliament for young people, youth parliament. It could also just be civil society at an EU and national level as a way of engaging with policy. Anyway, I'll, I'll end it here because I can answer questions later. Thank you a lot, Shana. I think now you have uh, like a bit of an overview uh, to get us started was what the report has told us. And one of the things it has told us is that there is a lot of critique, especially towards more traditional politics. There is distrust, there is images of all politics is corrupt. But of course, all critique also deserves a response. And I'm very glad to have uh, with me um, today Thomas Rune, who is here for two very good reasons at least. One of them is that he's a member of the European Parliament, so he is an elected official. And of course, we also need definitely uh, to hear him um, talking about this topic, also what the challenges perhaps are um, to engage. And there is a second uh, great reason to have him here. Previously, uh, before um, serving the parliament for decades, he um, had leading uh, positions in youth-related uh, work, um, youth sector-related work, both on the trade union side and on the public side. So he also really knows what he's talking about when he's talking about policies, good examples, what could work um, to, to engage uh, young people. And with no further ado, Mr. Una. Thank you, Matteo, for this nice uh, introduction. And uh, thank you very much for the invitation and for the opportunity to talk about the question how young people who are facing disadvantage, social disadvantages view democracy as a whole. And um, I think after the introduction of Shona Cohen, uh, I cannot add something new because uh, it's, it's all uh, findings that are uh, that are have been developing, I think, over decades, what, what happens in, in Ireland or in other countries. I think it's uh, very similar to, to other countries, and uh, I know it from my perspective as a German youth worker in the last uh, 30 years. And I will talk to you uh, from a perspective of a um, member of the European Parliament, as Matteo said, with a professional history of youth work in Germany, and the third kind of filter will be that I'm a social democrat. During the last uh, years, the, prob the problem of approaching young people outside the structure of formal education, everybody has to go to school, but we have all the time outside the school, um, and how we can inspire them uh, to contribute to social life was discussed in many member countries. My background as a youth worker for trade unions and in the area of international youth exchange, as well as uh, in the umbrella structures of youth work, leads me to some ideas that I would like to share with you. First of all, we can see, I think it, it's true for all uh, member countries of the European Union, we can see a continuing disruption on a socio-economic level in many societies, which clearly shows that the opportunities of young people depend on their social status, for example, on the level of formal education, or whether they live in rural areas or in an urban environment. And you had many more uh, points to uh, make this kind of uh, difference. There are young people who are facing disadvantages in different ways, be it young migrants or refugees, youngsters with an LGBTQ background living in rural areas, pupils that did not succeed in their school careers, or youngsters living in poor housing conditions, and so on. We could continue this list. I think it's not even possible to list it completely on one page of your presentation. These kind of disadvantages affect the opportunities to participate in organized leisure time activities, which is one uh, very important uh, part of the life of young people, in projects or in actively shaping their own environment. In fact, it is a challenge to win these groups for an active participation in civil society and for democracy. Therefore, 
I think equal opportunities should be granted to every young person and should not depend on the financial possibilities of the parents or of the youngsters or the level of education or the other factors of personal background which I have mentioned before. Not only is it a task for governments to change this situation, it is also a field which has to be worked on by social or youth organizations of civil society. And I can wait. Um, and in order to promote participation among young people, youth organizations developed a lot of projects. It's, for, it's true for different countries, I think m most of uh, the member countries in Europe, aiming for an improvement of such opportunities. From my point of view, it is important to demonstrate that democracy is not a game of the few played behind closed doors in the city councils or the parliaments, where the contribution of the people is reduced to a single vote every four, five or six years. And in between the role is the role of spectators only. That's what many young people feel, but we have to show them it's not true. Rather, democracy will only prevail when, when we succeed in gaining the civil society for an active participation in shaping the different parts of society. Hence, this needs to be done outside the closed shop of parliaments on whatever level. The role of governments and parliaments is to initiate and support this process. To this end, we could turn to a discussion about the quality of education systems in the different member states and how to provide high quality education for all, regardless of socioeconomic status, how to invest in schools in disadvantaged communities, how to provide additional resources and how to implement policies that reduce educational disparities. But I will leave this untouched. For me, the first step to develop a society where participation is a natural part of it is to win young people. In other words, how can we inspire them to participate? So how can we do this and what do we need to succeed? First of all, we need a social framework which secures the conditions you need to develop activities, which means the absence of poverty and inequality on a very general level. Every young person must have an opportunity to participate in whatever project, which in turn means that we need a good financial support for all the organizations providing offers in this context. This is a key prerequisite to enable youth work, not only in Germany, where I know it from, and all of you who were or who are actively contributing in this context may remember the discussions and fights with the respective treasurers, mayors, city councils, ministries, and so on. I have three examples to show you very briefly how this could work, bringing young people to participation. First, the real basic and ordinary youth work in an organization where young people of the same village or city district come together on a regular weekly basis. All they need is to be interested in the specific offer of the youth organization. An excellent example may be junior firefighters. I know this from a, the, my own perspective and I know this from the perspective of my son who is an active junior firefighter. Youth organizations in Germany, like uh, the, the junior firefighters, have ordinary meetings of groups with a simple leisure time program or qualified education. They need to become voluntary firefighters, which is very important, especially in rural areas, but also in cities with many different uh, districts. Youngsters of all classes, there is no need to be rich or to have a, a, a special standard. Youngsters of all classes can be members of groups like this. In rural area, areas, for example, in Germany or in neighboring countries, it is even needed that many young people contribute to this kind of service. We can find the same framework and the same structure in the groups of the Young Red Cross, of the Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, and so on. A second example, is the ordinary youth center you find in many cities where you have mostly the disadvantaged young people, disadvantaged uh, seen as a, um, as a lack of education, 
for most of them. In Germany, it's like this. You have this as the meeting point points for young people who only attend the basic schools and that don't go to a secondary level of education. And um, this work is a very, very hard work with this kind of, of, of young people because you have to meet basic needs. You have to discuss with them um, basic um, challenges they, they face and you have uh, not only leisure time activities but you have many, many, many challenges to meet as a professional youth worker in order to make these young people um, get fit to live in a society like we have now. Um, a third example may be <coughs> what I did in the last uh, almost 20 years. It's a kind of intercultural exchange uh, between countries or between uh, different cultural groups. For example, um, as an additional offer to the system of vocational training, we have the Erasmus Plus programs in the European Union. <coughs> and I was lucky to develop programs in this context for many, many years between Germany and the Czech Republic. And this is a, a group of, of young people which normally are not covered by offers of international youth exchange or uh, by offers of, of school exchange, because in the, in the vocational schools, in the, the vocational education, you normally have to stick to your profession and what you get learned or get taught by, by the uh, teachers and um, the programs that take you out of this for three weeks and show you a completely different culture and how they train the, the profession. For most of them, I, can't, I could talk to, it was... Uh, it was the best uh, best experience they had in their lives. This was <coughs> these were only three examples, and I'm, I'm, I must apologize that I don't have the time to to give you a, um, an overview about the possibilities. There are a million more uh, examples or possibilities, but what all these different kinds of programs of youth activities have in common is that they are something like laboratories for participation and democracy. If the youngsters can participate and decide on the program in youth centers, they will learn how to discuss, how to find compromises and so on. Of course, this implies the necessity of different training methods and of a certain quality related to the education of youth workers. You cannot do this with uh, somebody who just wants to do this, but you have to train them. But overall, young people would learn how to participate in the decision-making process. As Social Democrats, we emphasize the importance of involving young people in decision-making processes that affect them. This could include youth councils, advisory boards and other mechanisms that give young people a voice in shaping policies that impact their lives. Most of you know the European Youth Forum, of course, which is the roof or umbrella organization of national youth councils of the member states and other European countries. And the Youth Forum, uh, Forum <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, the Youth Forum uh, particularly addresses the European level and we know many countries which have similar structures on a national, regional and even local level. And young people learn there how to, they can cooperate from different organizational backgrounds, from different points of view and how to find compromises on all matters that concern young people. Other structures might be youth parliaments, youth forums, you know uh, the different possibilities. We could extend this kind of thinking on the different aspects that are covered by our programs, but I think the study that will be, or was shortly presented today, will show many of the findings that illustrate the wide range of the discussion on participation. And finally, Matteo asked me one last question. It was, how, uh, how is it possible to get into contact between a member of parliament and young people? Uh, young people facing disadvantages, that's the correct uh, expression. I think um, if politicians are not talking to young people, uh, it's, a, it's a very big mistake. We have to attend every uh, opportunity of discussion in schools, in the non-formal structures, wherever young people meet. And I can assure you, I'm not so my, my time in Parliament is not so long. Until now, it's only the seventh month now. 
but I have I had meetings with young people. I don't know. It was I think uh, almost a third of the work outside the parliament was with young people <laughs> in schools, youth organizations, and so on. And next weekend I will attend uh, a meeting of the Youth Council of Bavaria where they talk about how to fight against the right wing parties and so on. And it's, this will be a very important part of the work I will be doing in the next weeks and months not only because of the election, but because I find it's very important to talk to young people. Yeah, I'll take over. Yeah, <laughs> thanks a lot. And I know that you have to, you have to run yes. to your next meeting. That's also part of the obligation <laughs> of a um, parliamentarian. Sorry? Ah, yeah, you're still you're still getting a back with you, which I'm sorry, <laughs> secretly pulling out of here. Um, also, with a copy of the report and um, a couple of nice goodies from Peps. You're welcome. <laughs> yes, thank and thank you for for being with us today. Um, all right. Um, so this this was already, um, I think, a, a very great intervention and a perspective by an elected official. And we want to kind of take a step back again bringing in the report um, a little bit uh, more. And Shana has already given us a bit of a more sober kind of overview of the, the study. And what we want to do now is actually um, provide you a little bit more examples from two of the countries uh, in which we did the research, which is Poland and Spain. And we have the, the authors of those studies uh, with us today. And what we would also like to do with their short interventions is to provide you a little bit more, because we did a lot of focus group. It was about, um, yeah, I think 100, more than 100 people in, in the countries uh, we, we um, interviewed, um, to also provide you a little bit with their words. So you hear what we kind of abstractly put as our findings also through some of the quotes from the focus group. So you also understand a little bit the framing they use and, and, and how they um, see things. And uh, for that reason, I have with me today Kilian Verswein Vega, um, who is the author of the Spanish uh, case study. He is an international policy consultant and also cur currently teaches at Rheinwald University in um, Germany, and I have also with me Adam Kostewski, who is a researcher at IBRIS, which is the Institute for Social and Market Research, a, a prominent one in Poland, uh, based in Warsaw. And yeah, you may come up. And yeah, Adam, Hello. you have a microphone there, which you would still have to unmute, and you will start. And Kilian, you can come here if you want. I think he's starting. Yeah, uh, this is correct. Yes, yes. This is correct, and you can go over it. Right, Kilian, uh, yeah, as you want. Okay. You can also stand here. Uh, okay. <laughs> as you wish. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Adam uh, Akostrzewski, and I will uh, I will speak to you about uh, how this uh, how our findings in our case uh, were impacted by recent election in Poland. Uh, so, first of all, so let's start with uh, the uh, overview of short brief overview of uh, these elections. Uh, it was uh, the turnout in this election was uh, historic in uh, recent history of Poland because uh, near, uh, nearly 75% of Polish citizens with the right of vote uh, went to cast uh, their vote. Uh, it was uh, the highest electoral turnout in history of, uh, cur of uh, current Polish elections. Uh, it was even greater than the uh, uh, time when uh, Poles chose to oust communists out of power in uh, 89. Uh, so how did the young people vote? And uh, they uh, young went to the polls in ex ex uh, exceptionally large crowds. Nearly 70% uh, of them uh, went to the polls, and uh, in comparison, uh, four years uh, earlier, earlier <laughs> only 46 of them, 46% uh, of them, uh, chose to cast their vote. So the increase is uh, very significant. So as you can see, uh, this is the vote distribution of youngest voters. So uh, the group of 80, 18 to 29. 
So, uh, as you can see, the civic coalition and uh, the left uh, were the most uh, popular uh, parties. Uh, this is the choice, or uh, this is the parties that are more to the cent uh, center or left uh, of the political spectrum. Uh, and, uh, well, I, I would like to uh, go over uh, three findings I uh, found are more intertwined with uh, election results now. So if you want to ask uh, why uh, law and justice is so low on this list later, so then please ask me. Uh, but now let's uh, go to the findings. And the first one is, uh, you may ask yourself, well, the turnout was very, very big for a young population, so how is the lack of agency one of the points? Uh, so uh, let's start by uh, and giving you an overview that Poland is aging society. It is uh, its fastest rate of aging is one of the fastest in uh, all of the EU. Uh, so, uh, like the quote that Shana uh, showed, like uh, young people in Poland are feel, feeling diminished because they are uh, more and more minority in their they, they, their country. So, the uh, this results in lack of agency. Uh, uh, especially disadvantage youth. So there is a deep sense of lack of prospects for changing their, their fate. Uh, and also uh, there was this uh, uh, sense that these people want to show awareness and need to sig signal, uh, signal their presence and their needs to political elite. So uh, that's why the numbers were, were so big. So. Uh, you may uh, you may say that while democracy was in danger because of unlawful uh, uh, changes in law uh, for, from the uh, previous government, the young uh, chose to show up, but it was rather against peace than in favor of the uh, opposition. Uh, so uh, it uh, brings us to the second point, uh, electoral debt. I chose to name it this way and I will, <laughs> I will uh, uh, explain why. So the uh, parties that were most uh, voted by the young people, the civic coalition and the left, uh, have the more uh, uh, progressive agenda like liberalization of uh, abortion laws, they campaigned for a secular state and of course, which is very important in the uh, context of Poland, uh, they offered various solutions of uh, housing crisis. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> young people do not look at this in Poland, do not look at this like simple promise. It's li more like that if uh, uh, if this government do not uh, 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 do not make effort to uh, fulfill those promises, uh, they will choose to not show up in the next election. This is very very possible outcome of uh, if they do not fulfill these uh, these uh, uh, these promises. And it's uh, more than likely that uh, the young people will turn uh, them so, uh, will turn their vote to the party of defiance. Like, uh, po Poland, Polish society ter uh, tends to vote for the new party that says it's it's very against the uh, mainstream. So they say it's like uh, uh, voting against their uh, the, the mainstream. So it could lead to that. But there is also a positive that uh, in our findings, we uh, one of the most uh, prominent themes was that uh, there was wide distrust of politicians and public institutions. Like young people uh, uh, often uh, used words like distrust, disgust. They are cheating in line. Uh, this was uh, this is political war to different ideological tribes. Uh, uh, 
the Polish society is very polarized. So uh, to see now that uh, young people are uh, more optimistically looking at politicians of the new uh, uh, new government uh, is a positive sign and honestly a breath of uh, fresh air uh, in the political uh, landscape of Poland. But it uh, has to be noted that this is honeymoon period. Like, if these promises, this uh, electoral debt is not uh, looked into in the next few months, in, the, in this term, uh, these uh, attitudes will cool. And it will, it, if it's not promised, if it not fulfilled these promises, then uh, this government will uh, have a lot of angry <laughs> young voters. Uh, so thank you for your attention. If you have any more questions, then I will be to your uh, disposition. Good. So from my side, I wanted also to give a few insights from the Spanish perspective. Because of course, for now, uh, we have been discussing the report from a very abstract perspective. So, And of course, many of the findings that we saw in Shana's presentation, are also uh, they come from the different case studies that we've made. So my, you might see that in the quotes that I selected, that some of the key arguments, they, they will appear again. But uh, the idea would be to leave the abstract level, so to say, and give a few examples. Uh, um, you know, what do young people actually think about it? And what were examples of quotes that uh, very much reflect what the ongoing problem is uh, regarding uh, attitudes of young people uh, in democracy? I would say that generally, maybe to, to make a very, um, to scale it down in a summary, so to say, I would say that there were two important myths that we could challenge through this report and which kind of uh, summarize the key ideas that we had. The first one, and Shana spoke about the data that we had from the Open Society Foundations, where we saw there's very critical attitudes from young people uh, regarding their support to democracy. Well, that's very uh, good on an analytical level to do service, but it's not sufficient to just have you know, critical opinions to make the jump to saying, well, this means directly that young people are less democratic. I think that was also the idea of this study, that it's not sufficient to just uh, stop at the macro level of the data. We need to go into the detail and understand what are the causal mechanisms behind it, because then, and that was actually what we found, the picture is quite different. So it's a myth that people, uh, that young people are less inclined to support democracy. The reality is they are very critical of the current, current functioning of democracy, not so much of democratic values per se. So when we went to the different focus groups, there was actually nobody who said, you know, I'm so unhappy with my situation that I would support an autocratic regime. That was not the case at all it's usually even a position of we want more democracy. We don't feel that current democracy is uh, including my voice and we really need to improve democracy. So you see that, you know, the jump was too quick. Uh, you really have to look at, you know, what are the precise elements to understand the full picture. And the second myth, which I was partially also surprised myself because I also to some extent went with a a preconception which which ended up being wrong this idea which you see it in the media you see it you know in many academic papers this idea that young people nowadays are less interested in politics uh, on a general basis or well, actually if you look at the data uh, it's it's the opposite is true like if you compare the young generation from current times to young generations in the past actually abstract interest in politics has increased what has changed is the attitudes towards active involvement. So, of course, there's a difference between interest in politics and then that this translates to active involvement. And that's where the problem lies. So not the interest in politics per se, but, you know, the active involvement. And we found there were two key reasons. Uh, first, and this was already mentioned by Shana, this tendency to be more critical of you know, traditional mechanisms of participation. 
So for instance, uh, political parties, they were quite critical to, towards them. And then there was a social economic component as well, which we found very interesting, <coughs> which is the more you're in a vulnerable position, the more afraid you are to you know, expose yourself. And because you, if you join, for example, a political party, then you might fear the consequences in your work environment. What will my boss think about it? What will my family think about it? So of course, there's a socioeconomic element. The more your economic situation is stable, the more inclined you will be to participate because you feel you have a network, a certain security, where you can actually voice your concerns or voice your political attitudes without fear of the consequences. Right? And this is just to summarize the different opinions and the different positions that we found in the focus groups. So very clearly here, you see that you know still there was a majority that directly to the question of do you support a democratic system, they would say I'm very much in favor of a democratic system, but there was always a but, right? We need to be more efficient. We don't feel like it's working 100%. And then there was another group which was a minority, but still a significant group that was arguing, well, actually, I'm um, against the current democratic order. But again, you know, they said when we asked more questions, they are against because they feel like the current system is not efficient enough. It's not providing solutions. So you quickly see that when you just do the first question, the positions might seem very uh, different. But when you go one level deeper and you understand the causal mechanisms, actually the positions are quite similar. So it's oftentimes a semantic question and also the type of question that, that you ask will inform the different results. And again, you know, nobody said, I want a dictatorship. And here, just a few, let me highlight especially this quote. I think it's a good summary um, of the type of arguments that we found. I mean, you see here, it's a quite a radical statement. And even in this radical scenario where, you know, a person argues that we actually don't live in a democracy, or well, actually, you don't find an autocratic arguing, but, you know, the, if there's a very radical and critical statement, it's in favor of more democracy and saying that actually we need more active participation. So again, you know, the ba baseline values. So if you ask about the principle, one person, one vote, everybody will agree, but then the question is more about how does the current system of participation work? And similar then with, with the other uh, quotes that I also put here. And there's also a key question around access uh, to, to participation. That's also what uh, Thomas Rudner was talking about. Um, we found also an element that, for example, youth organizations in Spain, the Spanish Youth Council, their budget, especially during the conservative period, so the, the Rajoy government, was scaled down massively, and that, of course, also has an important impact on the type of representation that you have for young people at the national level. And in general, I would say that there's a very high discontent on the polarization as well of politics, especially in the digital sphere, and that's an interesting element because that's also a factor for young people to decide not to risk their, uh, you know, the, the image that they have in their social environment. Because they know if they enter the political space and if they're open about their positions, there might be a big backlash if, you know, we live in such a polarized scenario. And here, just to finish with this, um, also just the idea that, again, you know, as always, the economic and the political go in hand. So many times when we were asking political questions and questions like, are you happy with politics or democracy in your country? Then the type of answers we would get would be economic ones, which was surprising because oftentimes they would jump directly. You know, it's a political question, but they jump directly to the economic um, troubles. And here, just to finish with this graph, of course, you know, the socioeconomic element is key in this idea that I explained that, you know, socioeconomic hurdles also uh, lead to a situation where young people are less inclined to participate. Well, that's very alarming in a scenario where, you know, actually young people in, in the age between 16 and 29, they're less and less able to be financially independent. And that's one of the key reasons, I would argue, why they actually don't participate in politics, because their mind is 
and other issues like how do I survive until the end of the month? How do I, you know, get forward in my life? Um, and here's just a summary of this idea that you know there's uh, this um, uh, this hurdle on the socioeconomic level. So yeah, that was my presentation, uh, just to give a little bit of you know practical insights as well. But of course, the idea now would be to to open up the discussion in a panel debate, and then also uh, with all of you. So I would thank all at this point. Thank you very much, uh, Kilian and Adam. Uh, indeed, um, we'll now enter the discussion stage uh, of, of the event. First in a panel debate, and then there will be later a short coffee break. And then, with all of you together, we have a format which is hopefully much more interactive than the usual Q&A for all of you to come, come into a discussion. But let's start uh, with the panel discussion. I would uh, invite all the speakers up, up here on the four seats, uh, which is, uh, yeah, you should all be here, and then I'll introduce you. <laughs> <clears throat> Shana as well, do you want to, yes, <laughs> <laughs> you thought you could lean back, not quite yet, uh, I, you can share those two and it's just that they are switched off now and then you can switch them on, all right. So thanks to, to all the speakers to be here. I'm going to introduce you briefly. So Shana, I've already introduced, so I don't need to do that. And then following um, from the left to the right, we have with us also uh, Ötzke Kara, who is the Director of Policy and Advocacy of the European News Forum, which has already been alluded to uh, by Thomas Rudner early and um, early on. And I'm very grateful for you to be here because also to give you, because your organization also represents the young people's interest also here in Brussels doing advocacy on these issues and yeah to hear also a little bit what is the EU already doing about these of some of these issues and perhaps also an assessment on what still needs to go better. We also have uh, with us uh, Sophie Amalie uh, Stage, I, I pronounce it correctly, the Secretary General of the Young European Socialists and um, also very grateful to have you here because a lot of the things we heard especially now by Kilian for example is um, that there a lot of the issues seem to be kind of very in tune with social democratic key principles of how to fix things. So you being a representative of the, the, the kind of the youth organization of that movement, it's very good to have you here and explain also some of these things. And then last but not least, um, Elisa Gambadella, the Education and Lifelong Learning Coordinator of Solidar. Solidar is a European and a global network of civil society organizations working to advance social justice. And again, there's at least two good reasons to have you here. First of all, to explain to us a little bit more also what education can do to address some of the issues we heard about. It can't surely address all of them. There are structural issues, but education has an important role to play. And then secondly, as I unfortunately only recently learned, you're also running um, or spearheading um, kind of a sister project to ours, it seems. Whereas ours took more of a research angle, so you were, yours is more taking the educational angle, really trying to actually engage exactly that subgroup of young people we're talking about in making them participate and engage more. So young people facing disadvantage. So I'm sure you will also have some great um, examples to share with us of how some of these things could potentially work better. So I want to focus on three and a half questions. <laughs> um, the first, uh, the first topic I would like to, to go into is kind of to frame again a little be bit better the social economic disadvantage. We heard a lot of keywords, we heard precarity, we heard housing, um, we heard um, kind of um, intergenerational not voting and coming from like a lower class background. But um, I would like to uh, start with Shana to explain a little bit better some of the specific forms of social economic disadvantage you were able to tease out through the comparative studies like what were some of the topics which really helped people back from participating what was really kind of the impediment to that you touched upon it a little bit but just in two three minutes to kind of briefly sketch out these things before we then go into the discussion with the other speakers so uh, thank you in um when I was doing the research in Ireland, then when we had the collective conversations about whom to interview, um, I looked for people who it was definitely where they came from. So disadvantage in it, that will affect you if you put your address on a CV. 
Um, people will know, like, if you're from North Dublin, where, I don't know if you followed it, but there were riots recently in North Far Right. But, so that is an area of high deprivation. So that was one one barrier really is where you come from in the area that you grow up in. It could mean that um, the schools aren't that great, that also the employers are a bit nervous about hiring you. I know that in France it's a similar situation if you put your address on a resume, it, you may not make it, or your name, if you happen to have a Muslim name, it may be more difficult to access a job. A traveler in Ireland will um, hide their name, or, they, or they, they may not say where they come from, but sometimes you can tell from their accent, so they might work on their accent to make sure that you, you don't know that they're a traveler, because it would affect your ability to be hired. So there's this kind of discrimination in your background and where you're from and who you are. And then um, education is a big one. Uh, the possibility just to attain any kind of professional qualification is really important, the ease of doing it. So it, um, it's not just the, the money, it's also just knowing that you, um, you can take that qualification and you can easily transfer it into something in the job market. So we were also looking at young people who are struggling in the job market um, or who are unemployed. Youth services was a popular um, destination for jobs because people had really benefited from doing it and that's something to think about going forward. And I'd say the last one um, that in terms of disadvantage, lack of public services and social housing was a big one. And Ireland has a housing crisis and it has, in this study, it had the highest percentage of young people still living at home, I think more than Spain. So, so young adults in their 20s, I think it's the highest in Europe actually of young people in Ireland who are still living with their parents, because especially in Dublin, because they can't access a house. So that was another saw indication of disadvantage that you're still living at home, you're not really able to leave, you're not really able to lead a fulfilling life. And I think that that comes back to the lack of interest in politics, because you can't actually mature as an adult in the current with the current political system. Yeah, thank you a lot for that insight and exactly moving on to you, Eske. Okay. Um, in your role in the European News Forum, you, you focus a lot on policy, EU policy and, and advocacy. So my question to you would be, especially on these so social economic problems that uh, young people, not all of them, but a substantial group are facing, what is the European Union already doing for them and what's maybe missing. Of course, this is not the space for great assessment, but just in brief, like to give maybe also some of you who don't know all the details about it, like a little bit of an idea. Yeah, so um, from my perspective, the, the European Union is unfortunately falling short in addressing the concerns of young people, especially uh, transitioning from education to labor. It still is a significant challenge for young Europeans. And one of the issues that we have really worked at the European Youth Forum is uh, the unpaid internships, which is still a big, big problem, uh, especially for those coming from a lower socioeconomic backgrounds. A research that we have made shows us that an average monthly cost of an unpaid internship is over a thousand euros. So of course it is not possible for everyone to take this unpaid internship opportunities. Uh, in 2023, we actually campaigned a lot on this and we have collected uh, 8,400 signatures and we have really advocated for an EU directive to ban unpaid internships basically or to ensure fair remuneration for interns. But we are in 2024 and it seems that there is not going to be any legislation on this. Um, so this is really disappointing and sad for young Europeans. Um, the research that you have also made that it shows that um, the poverty it disproportionately affects young adults and especially women um, so basically this means that those people who are coming from already a disadvantaged background will not have an access to internship especially if those internships are unpaid and that will just deepen the inequalities and the marginalization in our society another area that we work on again from transition to education to labor is platform work we see that a lot of young people especially those coming from marginalized backgrounds especially migrants uh, find themselves in platform work um, you know the delivery or like these uh, this gig work basically and uh, 
right now there is a potential EU directive on this that is going to be discussed at the Council level, but it is also going to fall short um, in terms of protecting these workers and giving them adequate legal uh, protection. So I think that there are still gaps in EU policies in order to ensure that this we support young people from transitioning from education <coughs> to labor and also really look at these areas where the marginalized young people are more potentially at risk. Thanks a lot. And uh, then I have a question uh, for Sophie. So, right, um, as somebody kind of um, being the lead also of the, the, the um, youth organization of the, the Social Democrats and Socialists, uh, sorry. <laughs> this right. I'm just I'm, I'm just wondering um, a twofold question basically. On the one hand, are these challenges actually also driving people towards you, as in they actually come to you to solve the issues? And then secondly, also within the movements, are these kind of issues that Shana has mentioned that Erzke has mentioned are those the issues you're also trying to tackle? Is this what kind of drives you, or would you like to add some more from your perspective? Um, that would be interesting. That's it. <laughs> okay, perfect. I might uh, be representing the young socialists, but apparently I don't know technology. <laughs> uh, anyways, um, no, so especially to your last question, I mean, the easy answer is yes, this is the core of what we're combating. This is the core of why we exist. Uh, and in my experience speaking with uh, all of our different members, uh, is that the reason they become active in a social democratic uh, labor uh, youth organization or socialist uh, organization is because they have either experienced social injustice on themselves or they have seen social injustice among them. And most times, uh, because they already experienced it as a child, they saw how different uh, they grew up, they saw how people um, who came from richer families, had many abilities, they had lots, uh, lots of free time, they had um, lots of uh, energy, if you can say it like that. And people growing up in more poor families, they had to spend their free time helping with, uh, maybe they had to uh, go with papers or something like that, helping with the finances in the family. Uh, they had to spend their free time um, doing the groceries because there wasn't, enough in it, uh, there wasn't enough time from their parents to actually uh, do normal day-to-day -day tasks because they had to work extra hours all the time time. So I think social injustice is the, the key word of why uh, most uh, young people decide to become uh, part of the socialist movement. Um, does it then drive them towards us today? I think we have to focus on also one of the, the last key points that they were set in the end here that a lot of young people are afraid to bind themselves to a political family. They are afraid that it will have consequences on um, maybe if they can get a job in the future, everyone is very aware what they, uh, how they are perceived and uh, what they are viewed as. Um, and oftentimes they will look at the party within their own country, that the adult party within their own country representing that kind of policies. And if they don't think they do enough, then they would much rather go way further out left or I mean even right for that sense, um, than they would go with one of the more traditional parties. And I think that is probably also one of our uh, core issues as the young socialist, is both um, convincing young people that if they become a part of our movement, then we are also more able to push for actual action within the adult parties. Um, but at the same time, uh, it's a two-way streak, because then we also need the adult parties to listen more and to actually be able to take in the ideas and the perceptions uh, that we have. Uh, after all, uh, in the end, uh, these young people, whatever they vote when they are in their 16, 18, 25 years old, most people tend up um, keep voting in somewhat the same direction, uh, maybe not the same party always, but it's very unlikely to go from very far right to very far left, uh, at least. Uh, so it's extremely important that we uh, we capture them in the, in that age, um, and um, yeah, I mean it's a very young thing to say, but uh, from there I think uh, adults and the adult parties need to uh, to understand uh, the responsibility that they have in this. Thanks. That's uh, yeah, that's a great point you're making, um, Elisa. <laughs> As I already um, said in the beginning, it would be great to hear what you think, what role education can also play <coughs> as of today in kind of lifting people perhaps out of their social disadvantage. It's not the only thing and not the only um, 
yeah, factor influencing that, but just to hear your opinion as of today, like what is the role of education also tackling some of the social economic challenges that, um, that we've heard about? Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Of course, the education does have a role to play uh, in this and for this social mission. But then when we say education, I think we need to be a little bit more specific in the sense that if we talk about public education institutions, then definitely this is the place where people from different social classes can meet and see the differences and realize social injustice is there as well. Um, and definitely then a place to gain not only knowledge from the education curricula that you attend, but also awareness in social terms. And then the ability to then interact with others and maybe take action as well. And then there's, uh, and this is not the case necessarily, or most likely not the case with private education. So in this sense, I think also, and especially for the socialist and social democratic family, it is a, of absolute importance to keep pushing for funding for public education at the national and European level. And uh, then there's education in terms of content, of course. So when we talk about um, these kind of findings and how education can help addressing it, of course it's a matter of uh, uni really universal access to education in general, but especially access to citizenship education. And in Solida in particular, we work on global citizenship education and, and it was mentioned its importance, digital citizenship education as well, which is more than civic education. And then it's also a matter of what actors in education. Because so far I've been talking about formal education, which is of primary importance, of course, but we also have non-formal and informal education, we can, which can be equally, if not even more important and influential in the provisional uh, global citizenship education. If I look at myself, the way I acquired some citizenship education knowledge is, was yes, partially in school with civic education curriculum, and I was lucky that I had one because it's not always the case, at least where I'm from, but mostly through non-formal education in the Young European Socialist, for instance, or in the party uh, that I joined and in associations that I could take part in. This is how I acquired my own competencies in this sense. So my example is just uh, the easiest one for me to mention, to say that, of course, non-formal education should always be considered and taken into account when we discuss the provision of citizenship education. And in this sense, something, but I'm sure we're going to discuss it later more at length, something that I believe could be, should be pushed for is frameworks for allowing more cooperation between formal, non-formal, and informal education to make sure that all these actors can contribute to the benefit of the learner, of course for the provision of citizenship. Advantage more to also the participation and engagement angle, which is kind of, well, I'm an academic, the two variables we were looking at in, 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 the, uh, in, in the research. And Ötzke, starting again um, with you as well, with a very similar question, like I asked you about the social economic disadvantage. What about the, what is the EU doing to also help foster participation and engagement among young people? Of course, we do have a whole array of programs, exchange programs, some of them were mentioned, Erasmus+, plus, plus others which are specific to, to also people who don't, um, who face disadvantage, like Alma, they are also, they exist. But just for you to kind of um, give like a little bit of an overview what initiatives exist, if it's enough, and perhaps also an assessment what could be done better from European Union level. That being said, of course, we're all aware this is a multifaceted problem. You will have to tackle it local, national, EU, but since we're here in Brussels, because we are um, European think tank, to uh, yeah, talk about that angle specifically. Yeah, um, so actually, I think one of the one of the very valuable things that the EU offers is, of course, Erasmus Plus, that is uh, focusing for young people, and um, also the European Solidarity Course, which is the volunteering service. Uh, just coming before coming here, I was uh, reading a paper on evaluating the European Solidarity Corps, and I realized that th they actually have a goal in making sure that young people from um, vulnerable backgrounds are really um, participating in this uh, in this program that the European Union offers. Um, even though my perception of all times was only a certain demographic of young people uh, really have the opportunity to engage in these um, possibilities that the European Union offers them, I thought that it was always middle class, uh, white, you know, young Europeans who go to student exchanges or take part in these volunteering options. But uh, 
according to the data, 30% of the of the European Solidarity Corps volunteers come from um, vulnerable backgrounds, which is really actually really good because it really gives them, it means that it gives an opportunity for young people to engage in their local or any European community, do volunteering and also get support for that. So I was very happy to see. I think um, when we look at how a young person is organized, you have also mentioned that like you learned, you got your education in the youth organizations that you were part of. Uh, that is what we also see. Youth organizations are local, national uh, or European youth organizations are very vital for young people to take that first step towards democratic participation. Some people might say, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not, oh, I'm not political, I'm just a member of scouts. But of course, it is a participation. It is a, um, exercising democracy in a way to be a member of scouts and to be a part of that community. Um, so um, unfortunately, we are seeing that the space for the youth organizations is shrinking. Um, in, uh, in national levels, we see that youth organizations are often under attack. We have recently published a research and we saw that the fundamental freedoms of young people have decreased since 2011. So it's also in line with the decline of the civic space. Um, I think the EU really needs to uh, focus on um, national, but also European youth organizations uh, to provide them financial and support and administrative support so that they can continue uh, fostering engagement. And uh, they work with volunteers. They need people to be able to allocate certain time to volunteer in their organization. An idea can always be, you know, um, remunerating uh, the young volunteers, um, but for organizations to be able to do that, they also have, they should have access to finances as well. So I think this, uh, this should be something that we have to look at the European level as well. Great, thank you. Um, another question I have to, to you, Sophie, is um, how you deal with, well, I kind of ask a similar question, to, to, to Mr. Rudner earlier, how you deal with some of the sentiments which were um, described in the studies, which are those of um, a lot of distrust in the classical, traditional political system, which arguably, as a youth organization of a party, you are part of, and the distrust, the kind of miss about, it's all corrupt, they only show up during elections, all the, the quotes you've heard. So like how you and the member organizations um, that you kind of yeah, comprise, um, how, how they deal with these kind of comments, how they kind of maybe try to work against them to tell people it's different and yeah, to just hear about that. Thank you. Um, I think, I mean, uh, one of the answers, answers might seem a little bit simple, uh, but for us, uh, it's a lot about uh, getting out to the people. Uh, so being physically um, uh, attentive, uh, being physically there, speaking with young people at there. I mean, it's different from country to country how uh, close we are allowed to go, um, but going to their schools, if we are allowed to, to visit their schools and talk with them, or go out, talk on the street, go to different kinds of events where youth already are, um, and make sure to, uh, to also kind of show them um, I would say that I mean even that traditional politics is also sexy. Uh, that you don't have to be like very far left to be fun. You can also be a fun person and be a social democrat at the same time. But I mean, that we have to understand that young people, if they want to engage in politics, if we need to encourage them to engage in politics, they are not gonna like come and only come because they believe in uh, that they can change something. They also need to believe that they are uh, entering uh, a community, that they are entering a place where they cannot only grow as a person, they cannot only make a difference in the world, but that they are also able to gain friends, they are also able to have a good time, and all of these things need to go together, or else we are losing to a football club, or we are losing to uh, beers at the pub or something. I mean, there are a lot of things that young people can spend their time on today, and we need to make sure um, that uh, we are also uh, both a fun place to be, but also a place where people see that they are taken seriously. 
Um, and for that, I think there are kind of two strategies that can be taken. And of course, as you say, I mean, we're a pan-European organization, so we try to be very aware of the fact that there are also a lot of social cultural differences in whether or not you're doing something in Spain, and if you're doing something in Georgia, uh, where we're also working, or if you're doing something in Denmark for that sake. Uh, all of these things need to be taken into account. Um, but we're trying to be aware of these things with both um, working in the sense of talking about um where is the political standpoint like where uh, what is normal in the country already because in some countries it's not it's already not normal to be politically engaged especially if you're looking more towards the eastern europe or balkan uh, society here we need to have a different kind of approach uh, and the approach needs to be not hey go to us become a member but it needs to be hey we have something that you can do, this is important for you, this very specific issue is important for you to be able to solve this or to be, to be able to go to the politicians, to be able to be actually heard. Your easiest way is going, oop, anyways, your easiest way is going through us and is not going through these like very right wing, very leftist uh, um, um, societies that also exist, uh, but it's going through the traditional parties because we are already there. We already have uh, channels that we can go through and we can help you um, make the difference that you want to make. But it needs to start with not us telling them that what we believe is the right thing to do, but us going out and asking them, what is the most important thing for you? What will change your life right now? And sometimes it's something so simple as uh, going to high school and someone is mad that there is a very um, high, um, uh, that they demand them to be very attentive uh, in the sense that, that they need to go to 90% uh, of the education and if they get sick 15% of the time, then they will just not get their, um, uh, their final exam or something like that. It can be very something simple, but even something that simple, if we show them that we can make the change within us, then they are also more believing in the fact that, okay, then maybe we can also make the bigger changes within the traditional parties. So I would say that's the approach and how we are trying to, to both talk with our member organizations about it, but also how a lot of them are already working. Yeah, thank you for that. And especially, um, I think just very briefly, this kind of um, partly also struggle uh, in building community and um, parties losing that partly with the younger uh, organizations. I remember it's also something which in the Spanish study was uh, mentioned by multiple um, experts, the struggle to kind of keep that community spirit also alive for the younger generation, make them see it's not only about hardcore politics, it's also just spending time together and having a good time, right? Um, then Elisa, indeed, you already talked a little bit about the curricula and what, especially the, in the public school <laughs> system, what they offer in terms of um, political education. Um, I would like a bit more of an assessment, what you think EU-wide, um, how's it going? Of course, there will be differences, and I mentioned some of the examples where I believe like there will be differences between Hungary, Italy, and Germany, but just generally speaking, is the public school system actually delivering political education, generally speaking? And then as a second point, perhaps, uh, that you already um, mentioned, if it is not, or is there other organizations which the public school systems can also work with to kind of strengthen that kind of stream of political education? Yeah, thank you. Um, the way I'm going to answer is based on the experience of our members that are organizations delivering non-formal education through popular and citizenship education uh, present uh, across uh, Europe. So what we have observed, uh, thanks to them, is that um, citizenship education is often not offered in this way, but more in the way of civic education. But there is, in general, a scattered approach across the European Union. So in some countries, you have, for instance, a provision of civic education as a standalone curriculum. And in other countries, you have a provision of a civic or citizenship education as a cross-curricular matter. And when we ask our members what's their experience with this, they say that it can vary, honestly, because um, as a let's say, um, political approach to this and ideological approach to this and pedagogical as well, we would tend to say that the cross curricular one is better because then you can mainstream citizenship education across the different uh, subjects, of course. But then also we had members, uh, especially in Croatia, but not only they told us, yes, this is the case in our country, but then it happens that it gets lost through the programs of different subjects. So actually in the end, in concrete terms, the provision is not uh, guaranteed. And then there's also um, different um, 
methodologies for the delivery of uh, citizenship and civic education, of course, which varies greatly from a country to another, and also content, because we know that this can also be subject uh, of instrumentalization from an ideological point of view. Uh, in different countries, it has been the case. I come from Italy, and this is definitely a case where citizenship education has been used for um, foiling political debates that had very little to do in the end with citizenship education, especially from the far right. So uh, this is also a process that is ongoing across Europe and of which we should be aware, I believe, when we frame the um, need for providing more citizenship education. And then um, sometimes uh, citizenship education is provided with the um, uh, whole school approach, sometimes a whole community approach, which is something that we um, advocate for very much because it means that it's not only the formal education institution and the teachers in the most classical terms that provide in the most classical way uh, citizenship education, but actually they cooperate with what can be civil society or other associations that uh, then together with them help them with non-formal education methods, for instance, in the provision of citizenship education. And this then means that citizenship education is also provided on the basis of a learner-centered approach, which has proven to be way more effective in the provision of this uh, in the uh, acquisition in the end of these uh, competencies. But this is, uh, again, very scattered across Europe and even within the same countries and within the same region from one school to another, this may happen or not. And then the whole community approach is sort of the larger version of this. So instead of limiting the vision on the school community only, we look at the larger community and that's where you can get the um, best benefits out of this approach, in fact. Um, in this sense, there is also, as I mentioned before, a, a lack of cooperation between uh, formal, non-formal and informal learning settings or education. And especially for the cooperation between formal and non-formal education, this is very often due not really to the lack of willingness by formal education institutions or non-formal education providers, but rather because there's a lack of legal frameworks for this that really don't make it um, doable in practice for these actors to cooperate uh, well. So these are uh, a few points that I hope address your question. Yeah, they totally do. Uh, leaves a lot to be done, especially on like <laughs> it's like action points for for multiple agendas, I guess, uh, of, of different parties. Um, Shana, I have also one question for you on this, and this is especially, I mean, you've um, compared the results, big country studies from um, five countries. Um, and I'm wondering, especially when it comes to engagement and disengagement of young people, were there also some results which struck you as, this is surprising and maybe we can't fully cover it in this research, but we should dig deeper in terms of why people don't engage, why they engage, so kind of which new questions did, did um, the report perhaps also raise for you and didn't answer, like this, this would be interesting to know. Um, I um, I still don't quite understand uh, youth services. There was genuine trust in youth services across all of five countries, and I I um, uh, I mean there's the miss, some of it was really clear like there isn't enough civic education in schools, but youth services seem to perform this um, multiple purpose of this is what we trust, this is where we gain our values, these are the this is the kind of interaction we like. I think that um, I was surprised that what seemed to be the desire for face-to-face -face interaction among young people, that they want, like their politicians in the community, and they want to be able to relate to the politicians. So this, I think it's a, um, imaginary that everything has to be online. I actually mm. think it, it's, it's quite different from that, and that to rebuild trust, you'll have to sort of rebuild on a basic level a relationship between politicians and their their constituents. Um, I think that there's a missing component in the research about gender. I mm. just um, I felt like we weren't able to do that really adequately because it was such small scale research. So I think we would, you know, in Poland, I think that came out in Poland that um, women were not as vocal. We um, had the opposite in Ireland amongst the migrant. Actually, the women were more vocal than some of the men, and um, especially, actually, the travelers, the women from the traveler community and the migrant community. Some of them were just more sort of attached to politics and more willing to learn about it, uh, and I think that should be explored. That's interesting, yeah, and maybe that's our next project. I'll keep you informed. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, and now we've heard a lot about the issues as well. And of course, we all want to also hear about uh, the solutions, which is the last uh, question before we can all have a well-deserved coffee break. Um, so I want to learn a little bit about what you think are some of the most successful examples that you've seen on European scale, etc., that can actually like really clear-cut examples that can actually help with engagement and kind of also fostering trust in, in traditional politics and the, the system, the democratic system uh, per se. So it's good, maybe starting with you, like just some concrete examples also for people to take home and maybe as a second point, also briefly reflecting if some of those examples be, can be scaled up for more people if they're small. Yeah. Yeah, so actually um, one of the things that we focus uh, is vote 16, so the right for 16 year olds to be able to vote. Um, a really recent analysis shows that uh, in uh, Austria, uh, where 16 and 17 year old voters can vote, they are more likely to vote than older first time voters, meaning that voter turnout tends to decrease for 18 year old voters when young people leave the nest. So uh, we also found that 16 and 17 year old voters tend to have a more optimistic vision of politics and higher level of trust in government. And um, we have also found that the reason why a lot of young people, actually 68% of young people did not vote was not because of um, necessarily ideological reasons, but because of practical reasons. For example, they were on holiday or away from home. So basically, I mean, we have in six months, we have the European Union elections. I don't know uh, how many people know how to vote, especially if they are not residing in their country uh, where they were born. Um, so it is a very, very complex procedure. It is even more complex for young people who are uh, young Europeans who move a lot, do internships or uh, do exchanges or go on holidays. Um, and it was very interesting for us to see the 16 and 17 year old tend to vote more. This will be the first year that we will see uh, Germany and Belgium um, young 16 year old voters are going to vote for the first time at the European Union elections. So we will be observing it. But uh, it means that around 1.7 million young Europeans will vote for the first time. Um, and uh, in addition to these countries, uh, Malta and Austria already have 16 year olds voting and uh, Greece, it's 17 year old. So I think this is one thing that we really can see, uh, encourage more young people to participate. Another connected to this is uh, facilitation of other ways of voting. Um, so e-voting, uh, for example, postal voting, uh, facilitation of these methodologies will, I think, uh, increase very concretely the turnout of young people. Yeah. And for the uh, European election? No, nothing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I was suggesting to actually jump to that right away, also for a, a matter of time, to, to ask to all the other three uh, panelists still this uh, fairly concrete question, and then maybe some of the other questions I had, the participants will ask you later. Um, because we are, of course, facing a big European election in June 2024. So for all of you, based from your own perspectives as academics or working in education or politics, like also in the short run, what can be things to kind of increase voter turnout for the European elections? This is, of course, more the short term and especially educational components. They take much longer. But still, if we had to start tomorrow to do some of these things, what would they be like to really try to increase turnout and engage people in kind of this more traditional type of uh, voting, uh, which will take place in uh, five months? And whoever wants to go first can go first. I'm stealing the mic. <laughs> 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 um, no, but I'm, uh, I, again, I also a very uh, direct answer to this. Uh, and believe me, I've also uh, done my fair of fighting uh, with the adults about it. Um, no, but I think uh, what baffles me is that every single like real party out there, mother parties as we call them, uh, they want the young voters, they want the young people to vote on them, and they are asking the questions out in the air. What can we do? How can we engage with them? And it's a very small percentage of them that actually goes to their youth party or actually decides to say, maybe I should fund my youth party with some actual money so they can go out and do something and go meet the young people. Because I have never in my life 
met a 16 or 18 year old looking at a 50 year old white man and thinking this is the one this is the guy i'm voting <laughs> at it doesn't happen it's young people they see each other and we uh, mirror each other and we want to speak with each other and that's how the world works and that's how the world has always worked um so for me i would say i mean the very short term thing to do is that we need to get out to these uh, real parties and explain to them that instead of doing a campaign where they are trying to make a 50 year old man you look a little bit young on TikTok, that maybe they should ask their young uh, youth parties to be the ones being young on TikTok and giving them the funding to actually get out there, giving them the opportunity to fight a little with the algorithms uh, and so on. That would be like the, the very short term answer on that one. And then I would say um, at the same time that, I mean, we need to also uh, think about when we speak politic to young people, we need to think about not telling them. I think that's the, it's a little bit maybe re repetitive of what I said earlier, but I think one of the biggest like pet peeves that young people have with um, parties is that they go around and telling them, oh, but we want to do this for you and we think this is the right solution and we think that uh, we want to make you a housing plan and of course we need to do something about mental health, but it's very rarely that they get asked the question what do you think is the right thing to do? What do you think would make your life a little bit better? Uh, and I think if we change this approach when we're doing our campaigns, instead of telling them all the things that we want to do, because then we just put ourselves in a piggity of going into the EP parliament afterwards with maybe not the most of the votes, uh, and then we're not gonna be able to show the results, and then we're in the same situation in five years. So instead of that, asking them, what do you want from us? And then telling them honestly, okay, we're gonna fight for you. We're gonna fight for what you want. I think that is what's gonna make people believe in it instead of us telling them what we wanna do. This is the shortest answer I can, I can give. <laughs> you have a plan. <laughs> Elisa. If I can be next, I think um, based on our members' experience and also the project that you referred to before that is called the uh, AKA Active Citizens, um, what we really found find successful and important is to allow for self-organized activities, create the spaces and the opportunities for the youth to self-organize their activities and lead them, have non-formal education approach to this and approaches that are learner-centered and fitting in the local reality as well, because this has to speak to the reality I live in for me to be able to feel like I'm participating and I can engage with this. It was also said in the introduction of the report to some extent. But concretely, because we are four months and a half away from election day, um, youth-led activities work, which means youth organizations are the best means for conveying the message that it is important for the young people to go out and vote. So the most concrete answer that I can give to your question is support students' unions, support youth organizations in general, and civil society that is in touch with the youth, especially the youth that comes from disadvantaged backgrounds. I think this is the most concrete thing that we can do now, given the timeline. Of course, there could be plenty of things we could do in education, but these are gonna have an impact in a, a too long time for June. Gina, you also still have. Thank you. Um, so uh, one exception to the young person, the guy trying to look younger on TikTok, is um, Bernie is Bernie Sanders the American politician? Um, I've been um, really impressed about how a guy who's 80 could be so cool um, <laughs> to young people. And I think uh, one of the things I heard repeatedly in uh, the research was that we have nobody to look up to, and that's what civil society organizations said as well. That there's no politician that is an example for us. In Ireland, there are a few young um, politicians. Uh, but they're a tiny, tiny minority. So I think one of the best things that um, could, for this upcoming elections, is to recruit younger candidates, even if they don't do well, just the fact that they're out there canvassing um, means something. I think that, like, unfortunately, I think the far right has been really successful with that. Like, if you look at um, Rassemblement National in France, they, um, I mean, you have a really, I think Macron has countered with a really young prime minister, but, you know, they, I think Ma the uh, RN has done really well in recruiting younger candidates. I think they, you have to do the opposite. I mean, you have to, other parties should be doing the same. Or just invisible positions of policy making that they have some kind of influence. Right. Well, yeah, I, I completely agree with, uh, with the things that have been said. Uh, definitely young uh, support to party political youth organizations 
youth organizations and young candidates. Uh, European Parliament, right now, the number of members of the European Parliament who are younger than 30 is two. There are only two uh, members of the parliament who are young. So I think this is really striking. I mean, there were five in 2019. Uh, three of them got older. So it's uh, two. <laughs> the others didn't. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, so basically, um, basically, I think we really have to definitely have to change it uh, in this elections, I hope, also in a progressive way, to, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot for these insights. And I hope that you will also already form questions in your head because there will be space for them. First, there will be a coffee break of 10 minutes. So that makes us coming back at 14.25 to the room. Coffee will be available in the kitchen and also there in the back. And then we'll have a fishbowl discussion. So it's uh, much more interactive than a and a And you can ask all your questions to the panelists, to Kilian, to Adam. See you in 10 minutes. When you hear the bell, please come back. <laughs>